right, welcome to Face the Facts. I am Nick Face once again, whether I like to be or not. <laughs> Joining me to my left today, Brad Augustinelli. How are you? I'm doing fine. Happy to be here. We haven't seen you since a uh, little bit before Thanksgiving, so mm -hmm. welcome back to Face the Facts. Thanks. Um, we want to go over a couple different things with you today. We want to go over, first of all, with the Patriots. We have some breaking news into Face the Facts. There's a new player that has been that is going to be joining the Patriots when they take on the Denver Broncos for Sunday, and that player is Michael Floyd. Mm -hmm. Amazing, uh, amazing that he was able to get uh, to the Patriots. He was released by the uh, Arizona Cardinals on Monday. Patriots took a waiver claim on him, and they were able to get him. Mm -hmm. Overall thoughts on what you think about Michael Floyd? Um, it seems to be, you know, I feel like additions like this, even if they're not major at this point mm -hmm. in the, at the end of the season, could be helpful. Sure. Especially because it's kind of like um, supporting some people banged up. Yep. It's kind of supporting cast to kind of finish out the end of the season and, you know, propel them into the playoffs. So, well, one of the I things that I, I like about Michael Floyd is he was uh, very well respected by his teammates in Arizona, and he was paired with Larry Fitzgerald, one mm -hmm. of the better receivers that there, are, that there is in football. Mm -hmm. On Monday, he was released by the team. He's had a couple different instances where he's gotten in trouble with the law. Mm -hmm. And on Monday, I guess, or Sunday night, Monday morning, he was found uh, behind the wheel of his car, had drank... Uh, he had got a charge with a DUI. Mm. So my question here to you is, why would the Patriots want to pick up a player of Michael Floyd's uh, caliber and his history when the Patriots always like to say that they pride themselves in the Patriot way? <laughs> uh, good question. Yes. I don't know the answer for that, except for the fact that not. it seems like they have picked up, they've made the players work that are available to them not necessarily that they've, you know, brought in a lot of players with criminal backgrounds, but mm -hmm. um, even with players you wouldn't wouldn't necessarily expect to put a high value on. Correct. Bill Belichick seems to be able to make them work in some way. So I assume that's So bring in the here. thugs? I didn't say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I said maybe he sees some a way he can fit in on the field. I don't know what off the field, I wouldn't take a chance. Belichick did a press me. conference this morning, and the media kept asking him and trying mm. to poke that question, poking the bear a little bit. Like, <laughs> yeah. why did you bring Michael Floyd in? Why did you want to have a player like uh, of of his magnitude with with your organization? He goes, he's just like any other player, just like how yep. I'm talking about like Belichick yep. way. He's like, any, any other type of player that we sign, why is it such a big deal? Like, move on. That's basically what he was mm. saying. It was kind of funny. But it tells me that, number one, the Patriots tr are trying to get the most out of the value here mm -hmm. from Floyd by using him as a major asset for Tom Brady. Right. Yeah. Another thing, too, is the receiving core is a little banged up. Mm -hmm. You've got Bennett, who's still banged up from his injuries going on. You've got Danny Amendola, who's out until probably the playoffs. Mm -hmm. You know how much Julian Edelman gets hit and pretty much yeah, destroyed every retention. single game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're one hit away from one of those guys being out. Yeah. It's a good That's idea low. to have a backup guy being Michael Floyd, and who yeah. really isn't a backup. I mean, here's mm -hmm. a guy that about $8 million he's costed uh, the Arizona Cardinals. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was paid his free agencies coming up at the end of the season, so I mm -hmm. would think that he would want to show not just the Patriots, but – all the rest of football and other teams yeah. that, hey, really I still got something in the tank yeah. here. right. And another weapon uh, not without Gronk. This right. was supposed to be the season where he was supposed to kind of burst out of his shell. He had mm -hmm. a great season last year. I don't know if you remember some of his games that he put up with the Cardinals, but he was a major reason why the Cardinals were a pretty good organization from last year. Right. Yeah. He had a good mm -hmm. stretch in the playoffs. A mm -hmm. lot of that credit can be to Michael Floyd. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did a great job. Um, anything else that you'd like to add for the Floyd front? I'm just curious as to how, I mean, the typical Patriots teams wouldn't, I wouldn't think, would, you know, react adversely to whatever's going on off the field. But mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how um, him jumping in at this point in the season and with the incident being so recent, how that, if it would affect um, how things go and with the dynamic of the, of the chemistry of the team. Now, maybe you can answer that better than I can, but I'm just curious to see how people react. I mean, I think that if you look at players who have had 
maybe questionable histories from before. You got LeGarrette Blunt, who was one player that the Patriots took mm -hmm. and made the most out of his ability. Um, you've even brought guys in like Randy Moss, who mm -hmm. always had a questionable yeah, yep. history from before. And that ex mm -hmm. they worked out great. Yeah. I think there's a black cloud that goes over the Patriots a little bit with maybe some of the players they bring in, whether it be an Albert Hainsworth. Mm -hmm. There's a name for you from way back then. And, of course, you've got to look at the whole um, Aaron Hernandez front. Right. That black cloud, because the Patriots continue to pride themselves in the Patriot way, which I think is the biggest crock there is, <laughs> I think a lot of the league just opens up their eyes and be like, just shut your mouth and just, mm. if you want to sign players like that, then just don't pride yourself in the Patriot way. Mm. So assuming he wasn't, so he's not going to be suspended by the NFL. There's I don't no, think he's no going to be suspended. I don't think there is, which is, I think, ridiculous, that mm -hmm. there isn't a suspension if you get caught doing something as serious as drinking while operating. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it's a good risk for the Patriots to take. Mm -hmm. And I'm not for putting people behind or people on the field when they have a questionable history, but I think you give this a try. Mm -hmm. you, it's a million bucks that the Patriots take on because they claimed them. That's right. it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a risk worth taking. Sir, I mean, it certainly makes sense. I mean, I don't know what other contributable talent you're going to find now. Especially you're not. With, especially you're not. with the, the dearth of the I'm the shocked seniors. that he got this low mm -hmm. in the pecking order because waivers, let's put it this way, Patriots get one of the last opportunities to claim a player. Mm -hmm. So no other team wanted to claim him, or claim him or block him. The rest of the league allowed the Patriots to take him. Mm -hmm. That is bad. That's real bad. If you're the rest of the league in the NFL, you're saying, how the heck did the Patriots just get him? They already had, like, the best team. Let's just add on another player. I feel like the teams in the NFL are always saying that about the Patriots. Who was asleep <laughs> on the wheel on that one? Well, rest of the NFL and all the other teams, just want to thank you for adding Michael Floyd to the Patriots roster. I'm sure that the Patriots will try their best to get a nice touchdown with him this upcoming Sunday in, <laughs> in, in Denver. Mm -hmm. That gets me to Denver. Broncos are a team that... Just won the Super Bowl. Just came off their mm -hmm. Super Bowl run. My question here to you is, is there anything to be concerned about Denver for Sunday's game? Uh, it doesn't seem like they're the same as last year. I mean, obviously without Peyton Manning, but um, the defense is always seems to yep. be a threat. So um, I think what always what you look for is if they can get to Tom Brady. And if they can, then it might cause them problems. Well, we know one that. player who gets to Tom Brady quite a bit from Denver, mm -hmm. and that's Vaughn Miller. Mm -hmm. So that's right. one player I know that Brady will be looking out for big time because he is one player that could probably end his career mm -hmm. if he's not safe with Vaughn Miller coming at him. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's the one player on Denver that I'd be most concerned about. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I'm not concerned about anything. I'm yeah. not concerned with quarterback play. I'm not concerned with the run, which is 28th in the league. Right. That's just horrible. And then defense-wise, you got to keep Tlaib that's out there. That's one player you want to watch in the secondary. So maybe if it's Welker or – not Welker, excuse me. I can't believe I said Welker. <laughs> I mean Edelman, excuse me. Must be Oops. asleep on the wheel there. Yeah. But mm -hmm. Edelman out there, you got to look out for Malcolm Mitchell. Hopefully mm -hmm. he doesn't match up with Tlaib because Tlaib is a crazed lunatic. Mm. So you want to watch out for him. Makes sense. Um. For the running game, I expect just my expectations for the game. We'll do your expectations, mm -hmm. too. My expectations for the game is I think this is going to be a major run game for the Patriots. Mm -hmm. I see LeGarrette Blunt having a field day against Denver because they just don't block the run well. Mm -hmm. They don't defend it well. I also think James White will do something of value for the Patriots, and I also think that Deion Lewis could be a very nice surprise, and maybe having him score his first touchdown of the season. Hmm. That's my expectation for the game. Do you have a different one? Mm -hmm. um, a little bit in the sense that I don't expect them to show anything um, that perhaps they would be willing to conceal to use in the playoffs, whether they face Denver or not. Um, it seems like a pretty pedestrian game. You know, they're already 11-2 and two to, at the end of the season. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they try to take it a little easy, mm -hmm. just to, especially considering how banged up they are. See, that we were just talking off air about how it's really nice to have difference of opinions on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I have a major different opinion. I personally think that the Patriots will really destroy Denver. I mm -hmm. do. I think uh, the Patriots will come out. They'll be extremely motivated, kind of like how they were against the Ravens. Mm -hmm. I think that it will be a game where 
You'll see, like I said before, running game, it will mm -hmm. be very solid. But I think this is a little personal for Tom Brady. They had this yeah, game last they, time in the playoff. They had this game. Uh -huh. They lost 2018. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for a couple technicalities on the Patriots' side, they could have won that game. Mm -hmm. I think this is a chance for the Patriots to redeem themselves, win in Denver, and move along in this season. And I personally think, because on the last show that we did, mm -hmm. I said they're going to go 3-0 to end the season. I'm going to stand by that statement. They're on their way. 3-0. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So you have your side of it. Do you think mm -hmm. anything different could happen with the rest of the games? There's still the Jets and Miami to close out the season. Uh, Miami's interesting um, because they've really turned it on. I mean, they're, I think, 9-4, and four, so they're, they're looking good for a wild card spot at least. But I think the Patriots that, want something to do about that, though. They want to get they rid don't of them. want to face them. I think the Patriots, if they face them, well, they will face them at the end of the season. Right, they want to win. Play. Okay. They want to yeah. win. So how much does this affect, like, their drive to win in these last games? Because they've, they've been in this position so many times the last couple of years where they have a huge lead in the division, right? They're maybe only playing for home field. Maybe not even that. Maybe they already have. They might already have that towards the end of the season. So how – are they likely – are they always likely to – you know, motivate themselves to retaliate like this, especially. No, from they're last not. Year. And here's the reason it why. Seem like it. It's different this year because they do not want to have the same scenario happen from last year. Go to Denver. On the go road, to Denver. Yeah. Uh -huh. Go have to play at Arrowhead. Go have to play at <laughs> yeah. Oakland at the Coliseum. Yeah. They want to do that. They want to play right here at New England. They yeah. want their two games if they can get them right there or one game. Hopefully it's only one game. Hopefully the Patriots don't have to play the wild card yeah. because right now it's mapping out like they don't. Yeah, I mean, yep, they're one game. So home field advantage, that would be yeah. the championship game, which would be at Gillette. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, maybe it's going to be Kansas City. Maybe it's Oakland. Maybe it's – I don't think you want Kansas City. Some, something in that, in that scenario. Yeah. I don't want Kansas City if we have to face them at Arrowhead. The one team I think the Patriots can beat at either spot is Oakland. Yeah. I, I think they can do that. Patriots at Arrowhead, if you remember, if you turn it back two years, mm -hmm. when the Patriots had one of their worst losses in probably franchise history, when they got blown out oh, 40. Was that Monday night? That was yeah, a Kansas Monday City? night yeah, game at Kansas City. Yeah. They mm -hmm. got annihilated. Mm -hmm. That's a very tough place to play. So I personally would not like to see the Patriots have to travel there. Yeah. If Kansas City has to come into England, there's no way that they lose that game. Mm -hmm. There's no way. Yeah. I think this could be, and you may be surprised when I say this, you may very well see the Patriots versus your New York Giants <laughs> once again. Third time to charm. Yeah, well, we'll see. That gets yeah. me to my next side of things. Mm -hmm. Let's hear your side of the story. How are your Giants doing? Um, well, they had a big win against um, Dallas. Dallas twice this night. season. Yeah, they, which is interesting considering – that other than that, Dallas, I mean, the last couple of games, Dallas has seemed a little chink in the armor there, but um, the Giants just seem to match up well against them, especially if they have the running game going. And What's making the Giants so good this season? Uh, their defense has come together okay. um, pretty well. I mean, early on it was very shaky. I think they had a couple pickups in the offseason and it took a little while to get everything to gel together and a new head coach, Ben McAdoo. So, um, but they've, they've really just come together, um, and they've been able to keep – they played a lot of close games, mm -hmm. and they've been able to keep it that way um, and get a big player too, especially from Odell Beckham that eventually pushes them over the top, which is what happened in, against Dallas. I mean, it was just that one touchdown run by, by Beckham. Mm -hmm. um, and they still, make, they still make mistakes. They're still not perfect, but they pulled is it together. Is Beckham the real deal? He's very explosive and talented. Okay. Um, but I think – it's up in the air as to how he can put it together to be mm -hmm. a complete player in the sense that to take away the distractions and, frankly, the penalties he sometimes takes in the field. Right. Um, because, those, I mean, those have hurt the Giants. They've hurt the team. Right. I don't think, I don't think there's a question about that. I know we were talking last time about how we kind of wish that the players would just, you know, do their jobs and be that, be enough. Is but, he, and he's is an he example too, of that. Is he too much of a show, showboat? Uh, to me, he is. Okay. I'm, I'm sure, I, you know. So for you, are, are not, you much yeah. of a fan of his? I, I mean, is you, it tough? Can't, you can't argue with his success in the field, yeah, I mean, you can. and, and which is really the most, it, when you play sports, the most important thing. But I just, I just wish he would just like do his job. And, yeah. you know, why, to me, why is winning the game and being successful not enough? You know, why, why I, is, I would it, agree why on is that. it 
yeah. more? Why does it have to turn into a major celebration and even, mm -hmm. you know, it's all about talking him. and getting at the other team? That, that's that, what it that's seems what it like. Seems like, like I, again, from I watching from thinking, an outsider's but, point of view, mm -hmm. when I see him going into the end zone, doing all of his things, making it seem like all by mm -hmm. all, it, it, making it seem like it's everything for himself. Mm -hmm. I would think that the teammates for. Him on the Giants would think the same. I, I don't know. Yeah, I maybe he's just so talented that it's different. Um, so he's always a weapon. Yeah. And, and and they have a couple of the receivers, a rookie receiver, Shepard, and yep. Victor Cruz has been out a little bit, but he's back this year. But the thing the thing about them is if Eli Manning gets in the playoffs, he's usually successful. Yes, and he he's is. He's unflappable. And as lucky. You, as Patriots fans remember. Successful yeah. and lucky. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Yep. Some fortune involved. So, yep. um, so they could be dangerous if they. And it looks like they're on the path to playoffs. So if they get in, they could be dangerous. I yep. think. Now, playoff outlook. I have my. I've shared my opinions on previous shows. Mm -hmm. um, while you weren't here with us, I'd love to hear your side and what you think the playoff uh, kind of system will look like. Mm -hmm. Playoff outlook for this upcoming year for the NFL. Yeah. It's I always kind of it's always interesting to see who's picking up steam at the end of the season yeah. and who's falling back to the pack. Um and we talked about Dallas. I mean again with the two losses against the Giants, but they the last even the last game or two they've kind of showed some weaknesses. Yeah. And Oakland has come back to the pack as well. They're tied with Kansas City right now. Yeah. Um so I mean those are really at least in Kansas the thing with Kansas City is they don't make mistakes. I mean, they, they may, they may no. not be a team that can make a lot of big plays. I mean, Alex Smith is a quarterback, but he doesn't turn the ball over. And especially in the playoffs, you know, you can – I think at least you can live with that. Yep. Um, so – and, and Miami is there too. So at least in the AFC. Honestly, eventually, I think Kansas City may be the only problem with the Patriots. Okay. Um, because I, I don't feel like Denver is the same. Nope. Um, and I wouldn't trust Oakland. Nope. Just being – you know, the, the I'm trying to think of any other year. teams that stand out. Miami doesn't scare me at all. Um, yeah, I mean, I, Denver not doesn't. Really, but they made, the maybe Ravens don't. You mm -hmm. just saw what happened well, against. Yes, I mean they because they made that a game. They after, did make after it after a Patriots game. went up 16. What shouldn't have been a game. Mm -hmm. But they did make it a game. Mm -hmm. So, but that I, doesn't that doesn't affect your no at all no 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 because the, the Ravens Patriots. are now seven and six. Mm -hmm. So that's I thought overall on the Patriots side of things, I thought they played their most complete game of the season hmm. on all sides, except for special teams. Hmm. So I was very satisfied with that win that they had there. Yeah, and the Steelers are up there, but they're flawed too. I mean, yeah, the they, Steelers are flawed. Ben the, Lossesberger. There's two players that they have that are explosive. That's mm -hmm. Bell and that's Brown. Mm -hmm. If you're able to shut them down, you can pretty much be right. okay yeah. with getting a win there. And Roethlisberger's the NF... been a shell of himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, the NFC is more wide open. Yeah, it I mean, is. Not, I don't think there's really a dominant team. It, like I said, no. again, Dallas best record, but it seems like we've they're, seen. They're, I mean, they're as shaky a, as a, a on the Patriots side of things, you see what the best record gets you mm -hmm. out of the playoffs. Yeah, doesn't matter. It's about the hot hand. That hot hand has to be alive and kicking yep. when the playoffs start. So, I, I mean, my overall, I, I would say the Patriots are my Super Bowl. Um, I. Going back with the, with the Giants front, again, I wouldn't be surprised if it's mm -hmm. the Giants. Um, the team that I would look for to see right there in the Super Bowl would be Dallas. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think looking at what we've seen all season long, Dallas looks like the most complete team matched up mm -hmm. with the Patriots. Yeah. Those are your two best. So that's who I would look for in the Super Bowl. A very That would be a pretty awesome Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a lot of attention. More yeah. so, I mean, yeah. with Dallas, I mean. You're thinking maybe more so than usual, and you yep. know what the Super Bowl is here. So yep. that's a lot. Um, anything else on the football front? Um, Seattle separated themselves a little bit too. Um, a little bit. Yeah, yep. again, not, not the same as the last couple of years. But, um, especially they had, they had a win they against get, the Rams last night. Whoopee. Yeah. yeah. It, but if, if they get playoff games in their building, I wouldn't be surprised if they make some noise yeah. as well. In their building, I would, they're a dangerous team to, to have. Same with Kansas City on yeah. the building front. Mm -hmm. um, let's shift our gears over to baseball because we haven't really talked about baseball that much recently here. Um, we do have the hot stove kicking, which is the free agency time mm -hmm. for baseball. There still are some interesting players out there yeah. for players to add on their roster, yeah. one of which is Edwin Encarnacion. What is the mystery with this? What's going on? Why isn't he signed right now? The only thing I can think of with him and Batista is that, um, I mean, I know Batista's older, but there's still power hitters that really profile as DHs that are kind of aging. Yep. So, I mean, I would think that because power's at a premium, 
in the league, especially right-handed power, that they would have teams interested in them. Right. At least there would be some chatter about that, but I haven't heard much. Surprise the Red Sox haven't picked up Ben Canarcion. I, you know, I never, that never made sense to me. Okay. So, no, I'm not surprised. It always, I always figured they had plenty of hitting and they could slot someone like handling the DH spot. I yep. mean, especially since they picked up Mitch Moreland. Right. I mean, he's another guy they can put in there. So it, it never made sense to me. It never seemed like a good fit to me to have Ed, Edwin here. Mm-hmm. So, no, I'm not surprised. Any other guys that are still out there that you're surprised are still sitting out on the uh, pecking, pecking list? Um, no, not necessarily. Yeah. Um, I think there's still uh, moves to be made, mostly trades. Yeah. Mostly trades. Um, but... Yeah, I think the free agent market. There's not a lot. There's a lot, not a lot of bang for your buck out there. Like, it right wasn't now. as strong a free agent core mm-hmm. after, this year. after Cespedes. After Cespedes, back to the Mets, yeah. there was Chapman. There mm-hmm. was um, Kenley Jensen mm-hmm. with the Dodgers going yep. back yep. with yep. them. Yep, and Turner went back. Yep, there. Turner went yep. back there too. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have you know, and and Carnacion was the other big big lit big yeah. name that was out there. I'm surprised the Blue Jays haven't. Brought, they, one for of those some two reason, bad. want to yeah. move on from those yeah. two. And that's very telling. Mm-hmm. That says that something's going on there yeah. where they want to move away and go with a different system. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think other teams are picking up on that. And I think that Encarnacion and Batista may have to set up for one-year deals to mm-hmm. re-up their value. Yeah. So we'll have to see on that side of things. Mm-hmm. We personally haven't been able to hear your side of things on the Chris Sale front. Well, how shocked were you when this went down? I well, I had two emotions. I um, was pretty surprised. I was also relieved because the night before, I had gotten a notification from MLB that there was chatter that the Nats had serious interest in yeah, Sale, and the Nationals are in the NL East with the Mets. Yeah. And I could just envision them force feeding Sale to the Mets every other series, which yeah. the Mets wouldn't have handled well. So I was relieved that he is out of the didn't go to the NL East. But kind of surprised. I mean, we all knew the, the Red Sox needed pitching, especially starting pitching. Yeah. I didn't expect yep. them to make a blockbuster deal to bring an ace no. um, like Chris Sale to, to Boston. It's a move that I said off air I, I had wanted for years. Mm-hmm. It's something that would have been on my list probably since about 2011, 12. Mm-hmm. I've always liked Chris Sale. I always thought that he'd fit in well here with Boston. Now, some people may think Chris Sale is a flat-out nut. He destroys uniforms. He's over the top. Mm-hmm. You want that in a pitcher. I'm so sick of people saying, oh, I think Chris Sale's not going to work out here. The man is a competitor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In Can't all sorts of fashions. Mm-hmm. This man is like Kurt Schilling, like Pedro. He takes the ball and he dominates mm-hmm. each time that he can That's out true. there. Yeah, he and he's somebody that I think that will absolutely flourish with a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. I do. So that's why I think that this move is at least in the top five mm-hmm. best moves the Red Sox have made probably in the last 10 years. Hmm. Okay. That's even without Chris Hill pitching or throwing one single yeah. pitch yeah, that's true. in Boston. That's just my side of so things. So he's he's definitely durable and dominant. Yes. Um, which is, I mean, if you can go, if you can get those two things and in, in, in the top of the rotation, then I mean, I think you're doing pretty well. Sure. So what? Okay. The other side of it is, well, let's let's take Sale first. Yep. I'm interested to see how he does. Okay. Um, I think with the sense I got, especially the drawing back and forth that he was doing with the GM in Chicago. Maybe he was just getting sick of the losing. I, I mean, so. you, you, the, the White Sox were trying the last couple of years to bring people in, just nothing worked. So yep. maybe that was eating at him. Um, I don't necessarily think that he's not going to do well. I'm just curious because I feel like people you've brought in here in the past and think you're, they're going to do fine, maybe not have done fine. But he's a little different. I'll grant you that. He's different. Yep. The other side of it is it seemed like he gave up a lot mm-hmm. to bring him over. Yep. And I don't know what the, what the context of his, of his contract is or how long we'll be here. And he, like we said, he is an ace. But you've been talking about Mankata for two, three years now. And Kopech was another yep. – um, I don't know a lot about him, but I heard – I mean, I think he was pretty high up there. So yeah, he was high up there. What's your take on what they gave up for him? My, my side of things when I look at minor leaguers, some pan out, some don't. It's true. Yeah. Some – you think they could be good. And there's some that, oh, you definitely know they're going to be good. Mancada was still a could. Hmm. Okay. And the reason I say that is because he came up here and got a little taste of uh, MLB ball. Mm-hmm. And striking out 
eight consecutive times in a row and not being able to match up with a curveball, mm -hmm. it's hard to teach. Yeah. And that's something that you can't learn in the major leagues. You have to learn that in the minors and figure out what your approach is going to be. I was fine with giving up Mankata and Kopik, and the reason for that is the Red Sox already have a great amount of prospects that are already on their major league roster. Yeah. Xander Bogarts, Mookie Betts, Jackie Bradley. At least position players. Kelly, I mean, uh, Christian Vasquez. Mm -hmm. You have Blake Swihart. You have all Eduardo Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Even third, you can even look at, um, who's the other one I wanted to look at? There's another one for third. Uh, left field, sorry, Andrew Benintendi. Andrew Benintendi, oh, yeah. another guy. It's true. You already have your st things there. Mm -hmm. You were hurting in the pitching department. You were. David Price came in and completely failed when he came in last year mm -hmm. as, a, as supposedly their ace. Porcillo had a dominant season. Mm -hmm. But the question will be, can Porcillo do that again? You don't know. Sliding, Chris Sale is your one. Porcillo or Price is two and three. It looks good. And then yeah. Stephen Wright is in that fold, as well as Rodriguez, possibly your five. Buckholtz, too. You have Buckholtz. You have um, it was an, uh, uh, Drew Pomerantz. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of depth mm -hmm. right now. Yep. And now the Red Sox are at a premium where they can take calls from other organizations if mm -hmm. they need pitching. Sure, you can have David Price. Hundred, take take the contract. Here you go. Mm -hmm. Now you're on the hook for 180 million dollars. Have fun. They so, supply the power. So this doesn't strike you as impulsive at all, or if it does, it does not a big deal. No, it doesn't at all. This is something that needs to be done. I am so the, sick and tired of these media people. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't trade the farm. You build the farm to go get proven talent, mm -hmm. and it's so overrating. Over, it's overrated to continue to hear it yeah. all the time. Mankata, I'm sorry, he could be great right now. Overrated. White Sox have have Adam. Kopic, Red Sox already have another guy that they drafted um, from this year, and I'm drawing a blank on what his name is, and I'll think of it in a minute. But they drafted another guy. Uh, Jason Groom. Jason Groom was a mm -hmm. guy that they just drafted right. who's very similar, if not better than Kopik. So they could part with him. And Kopik is somebody that the Red Sox already were kind of frustrated with at the beginning of the season because yeah. he was angry with something and punched something out and broke his hand. So that's somebody that mm -hmm. is a hothead. And again, we, you know how I like the hotheads as pitchers. <laughs> so he might be the one guy that I may think would work for the mm -hmm. White Sox. Mankata is another player who is from Cuba, outside of uh, Ioannis Cespedes, how have the Cuban players fared in Major League Baseball? Hit or miss, but what, what is noticeable is there's a lot of hype for them coming over, and a lot of times they don't match up to the hype. Some of them, a couple of them do, but not well, all of them do. Word, word around the street, not really word around the street, but the buzz mm -hmm. was that the Red Sox did not care about giving up Mancata because they've already failed once. Castillo. With Castillo. Yep. So that was a major reason why yep. they, they were like, you can take Mankata. We're, we've seen enough. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So that's what I look at it on the mm -hmm. front. Um, I think that there's still moves to be made for the Red Sox for mm -hmm. adjustments they need to make on the roster. I think they still are banking way too high on uh, the beached whale, Pablo Sandoval. <laughs> However, he does look in better shape. amazing right now mm -hmm. with what they did. I think they locked him in a room and told him to eat lettuce wraps. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's in the best shape. So are they basically now. sliding him in a third base? Because they, they traded Travis are. Shaw. Yep. Which I was yeah. fine with, too. Yeah. Travis Shaw was overrated. Mm -hmm. Travis Shaw was a good teammate, and I'm fine with that. But Travis Shaw thought he was God's gift to hitting the ball, and he wasn't. Travis Shaw was demanding playing time when all he really did was in April hit the ball. Hmm. May, yeah. June, July, August, Didn't September, good, yeah. October. Yeah, I think he kind of – he Nothing. Rolled the coattails of the end of, I think, two years ago when he had a good end of the year. When yep. they, then they weren't in it. Um, yep. But, yeah, it didn't a bad out, year. So. Yeah. Travis Shaw, bad year. Very yeah. disappointing year. Mm -hmm. um, so they just slot Pablo into third base again. Right. And that puts Brock Holt as your major utility guy to be backing up at third base. Or... Which I think is where he flourishes. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I... I think it's fine to put – Holt should not be a starter. Mm -hmm. Holt is good to give 
Bogarts a day off, to give Sandoval a day off, Pedroia a day off, uh, Benintendi, Bradley, Betts, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Put him at a spot where he, you know that you can give a guy a rest, a little bit of a rest, and put Brock Holt in there and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. That's what I look at it there. Yeah. Um, I'm very curious with the bullpen with yeah. the Red Sox. Excuse me, my next question. What are you so, going to say? Where do they go? I just saw Junichi signed with uh, the Marlins. Now, not a huge loss. I mean, I know he's kind of deteriorated the last couple of years, but um, you have less bodies. And no Koji either. No Ko Oh, yeah? Koji's with the Cubs now. Oh, yeah. Year, okay. Oh, yeah. I did, I did yep. see so that. No yeah. Koji time. So, this year. Keg Krimble. I mean, that's, I mean, still got Joe Kelly in there, but you bring back Ziegler? I would like them to. Mm -hmm. I would. I want the Mets to pick him up. Um, for some reason, the Red Sox just aren't putting the attention towards uh, Brad Ziegler. Did great when he was here. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be a great person to add into that bullpen. Um, what the Red Sox did, though, is they were able to trade with the Brewers, mm -hmm. and they were able to get, and I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, too, but they were able to pick up another guy that the Brewers used as their mm. eighth to ninth inning oh, guy. Oh, is it Axford? Uh, it's not Axford. Um, I'll look at it when mm -hmm. when I'm talking when I ask yeah. you this. What do you think the bullpen should still have for the Red Sox? Is there some? Is there are there missing pieces? I uh, you I think it was proven last year that there were missing pieces yep. because you know there we people were optimistic about the starting rotation um, last year and they gave a lot of hits and a lot of runs outside Porcello, but in the end it was okay until the playoffs. Um, they had more, to me, they had more bodies that could get them from the fifth, sixth, seventh inning to Kimbrell in the ninth. And Kimbrell wasn't perfect, but um, he did the job mostly. So far, it doesn't seem like they have enough of those bodies that have been reliable in the past to get them to those last couple innings. Um, and especially with, you know, the increased use of the bullpens in the last couple of years, that seems to be necessary. So to me... I mean, I think a lot of teams are in that position where mm -hmm. they need, obviously, you can't have, the, you know, the old adage is you can't have too much pitching. Um, but middle relievers have always been to be hit or miss. Mm -hmm. And the big contracts, to me, I'm much more hesitant for big contracts with relievers, unless they're dominant closers, because you could pick people off of, you know, for lack of a term, the scrap, if they can have a good year mm -hmm. in, in, in the bullpen. Right. So, to me, um, you just ch try to get a lot of bodies in there and in spring training see what works out. The big move that the Sox made was Tyler Thornsburg. Mm -hmm. He was he was with Milwaukee from last year. I just want to give you his numbers that way you know them. Um, he had an eight and five record as the uh, as a reliever, two fifteen ERA. He was in sixty seven games. Let's see. And this was for a bad team too. Yes. So he's going to have a lot more support. Team. Strikeouts. He had. 90 strikeouts. Holy smokes this year. 90 strikeouts. Uh, walks per nine. He, it was a 3.36, so he pretty much throws mm -hmm. uh, a lot of strikes, which mm -hmm. is good. I like this strikeouts per, uh, per nine. Mm -hmm. Strikeouts per nine is the amount of you know, time, strikeouts that you can get when you come out there. Strikeouts per nine was a 12.09 mm -hmm. 12 mm -hmm. and a whip of uh, 0.94. Those are some solid numbers. Yeah, so if you slide in him, in him in there as the eight guy, yep, that's helpful. Very helpful. Yeah, and I also think looking at the Red Sox rotation, obviously seven starters does not match out either. No, I personally think that Pomerantz is going to go to the bullpen. Hmm. Yeah, you did have to part with a really good prospect to get Drew Pomerantz. Yeah, but I think that you just got to. I think adjust I'd rather the... I'd rather have Pomerantz in the pen than have Buckholtz mm -hmm. there. I think Buckholtz is your is your guy that's out of here, in a trade for so, somewhere. Someone's mm -hmm. gonna take him. I just don't. I haven't been able to figure out which suckers out there yet. <laughs> so, we wish them well. Um, any other things that you think we should look at for the off season in baseball? Any other moves that you think could um, happen? There are still trades to be made. I think, as I mentioned okay. before, um, a couple of them have honestly surprised me so far. I mean, like the the, the White Sox trading. Adam Eaton to the Nationals. Now, that wasn't surprising. It's what a fire sale over there. What was, it is, yeah. yeah. What was surprising to me was that the Nationals gave them their top pitching prospect back and two others. Yeah. Now, we were talking about prospects before. That's an interesting debate because mm -hmm. in the last, probably the last 10 years, um, I've shifted a little bit on that. Okay. Before, I used to think really very little of prospects and 
kind of similar to you in the sense that, you know, there's so many of them, and you know who's going to work out. So really, what you need is major league talent. And I still think that. Like, I still think teams with all young guys really in the end are not going to be successful because you need um, role players. You need stable veterans to, to show them the way. Um, but I've kind of shifted in the sense that I, I at least va va value prospects a little more now, mm -hmm. probably because of what's happened with the Mets. Okay. Because this was before they had all those young pitchers come up mm -hmm. and really turn the franchise around. The Mets and Red Sox are very similar with how they go about their prospect front. Mm -hmm. The difference is the Mets are able to home grow their starting rotation. Red Sox really weren't able to do that yeah. outside of John Lester. Kind of Lester. the opposite, yeah. And they let John yeah. Lester walk, mm -hmm. which is bad. Yeah. So really, we have one, which is still a question mark, and I would trade him in a heartbeat. That's Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of Rodriguez. I think he's... He's not the Chris Sale type of mentality. He's soft. He's David Price-like. Yeah. So he's somebody that I think should go to a small market team, mm, yeah. and he'd probably be successful. Yeah, I can see that. Um, the Red Sox, on the other hand, they were able to develop the, pros the uh, positional players yeah. better. Mm -hmm. So shortstop being Bogarts, Betts for center field, Bradley, yeah. Benintendi, all those guys. Even Pedroia. Mm -hmm. Pedroia's homegrown. Yep. Those guys right there... Since you already have that core, you can part from other pieces in your minor yeah. league system. To yeah, you have to look at it. Yeah, relatively. Up. Yeah, and this you was do. a good. This was a perfect example of that. Yeah. Yeah. Like they had, they had this. That's the, yeah, that's the other reason why you kind of make those big deals to kind of get a surplus of prospects, see who you think is reliable, and then part with the other ones to still high value, and then get something I, back. I heard that Mankata was very disappointed that he is now a White Sox. That hmm. he thought that. It was unfair that the Red Sox traded him. Something that he didn't learn about was that's part of the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If Mankata came up and let the world on fire, it would be a different situation right now. Yeah. But he didn't. He came up and he showed so many flaws that I thought it was I – th I actually thought as soon as they actually sat him down back in September. Mm-hmm. If you can't hit the curveball and yeah. you go up there swinging the bat like you're in a wiffle ball game, it's hard to teach. It's hard to teach. It's easy to figure out for pitchers, too. They're just going to so attack the, you with and that. And the pitchers are just going to attack, attack, attack yeah. like they did. Mm -hmm. So, Mankata is now a White Sox. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Um, we do want to close out the show just with a uh, probably about five minutes, probably between the uh, Celtics and the Bruins. Both, basically, both teams are about the same. Mm -hmm. They both have highly disappointing Highly frustrating, not that much help on the way. Let's look at the Bruins first. But, but my, my question is this. To me, the Celtics are more disappointed than the Bruins. Did you expect big things from the Bruins this year? No, I didn't. So I am more they... disappointed in the Celtics. Okay. I am more disappointed But obviously the they're Celtics. still disappointed in the Bruins because they're not playing super well. Right. But it's less surprising, I would think, than the Celtics. I think a lot of people knew that the Bruins were going to be – Probably worse than last year. Mm -hmm. We just right. knew because of the amount of money that we just didn't have. Yeah. It's just not about, there wasn't many signings that were able to yeah. be had. A year older with the core Celtic players. Celtic-wise, yeah. this is a disaster right now. Really? I think Disaster. So. I think disaster. And I'm going to be, I'm going to, they act, D, D is for disaster, right? That's what their grade is this also season for a so far. Yeah. So I think that the only way the Celtics get better is you part with the players that you have on your team that are prospects again. Mm -hmm. You have to bring a star somehow, some way to Boston. You have to. And it's not Isaiah Thomas. My goodness. He's a six player. Why are they making him a star? Why? He's maybe scoring a lot of points lately. I don't know. Oh, it's infuriating. It's a lot about the points. And it's in this guy's head or now. Maybe he it's thinks just he's by... the captain of the Celtics. It's maybe it's by default. I mean, oh. do they really don't have anyone else they can rely on, you know? I mean, I, I, I can't say it's a disaster. Okay. Because to me, if they had, at this point in the season, had been like, you know, 8 and 16, then that would be more of an alarm. But okay. um, to me, the Eastern Conference still is weak. I mean, you look at the – compare, the, le compare the leagues. Like, the Knicks, the Knicks are 14 and 12 and are fourth or fifth in the Eastern Conference. Mm -hmm. And I still am not sold on them. Right. But the Celtics have the same record, or they're a game below them. So mm -hmm. there's still a lot to be, not to be sorted out. Um, they, I think they, the Celtics do need. So I think that's the next step for them. They they need someone who's going to um, take them to the next level. Yeah. And I think Brad Stevens doing has, has done a good job. Um, 
Dota has done a good job bringing young players in, and Stevens has done a good job bringing them at this point. But, and he's, I assume, he's going to continue to do that. But I think they, they just need a next level talent. As we talked about last time in the NBA, this is the kind of stuff you need. I mean, you need a star or two to bring you to the next then level. Then who is it? Who is it going to be? Because I'm trying to figure it out. And the one that I'd love is DeMarcus Cousins. Mm-hmm. Especially, yes. a, yeah, especially a big presence. He is a yeah. hothead. Yes, he is mm-hmm. a very under-your-skin type of player. Mm-hmm. You cannot discount the numbers that this guy puts up. Mm-hmm. Day in and day out on a court. Put him on the Celtics. Yeah. I don't care if you have to part with Jalen Brown and Marcus Smart to get him. Mm-hmm. Make it happen. Just make it happen. Yeah, and especially that's with probably less of a supporting staff in Sacramento. I mean, with, with um, you know, better cast in Boston, yeah. maybe he'll even perform better than that. I yeah. mean, I think he could. I think mm-hmm. he very well could. Um, the whole thing on the Celtics front, we were talking about in baseball, the prospect front. Mm-hmm. Danny Ainge. He overvalues every single player that he signs or puts together on the Celtics. Mm-hmm. They're just overvalued. I'm sorry. Marcus Smart, I would ship out of here in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. There was a lot of excitement about him when they drafted him. But I'm not excited at all about what I see. He had a <laughs> wonderful miss. Did you see that wonderful miss Monday night? No, I didn't. To close out the game, he could have mm-hmm. won the game. Mm-hmm. Sat back at three, wasn't even defended, anything. Easiest shot in, the, my, in his life. I could have made the shot. And he missed it. <laughs> Lost the game. I just, I'm, I'm not a Marcus Smart fan. I'll never be a Marcus Smart fan. Mm-hmm. I want him out of here in a heartbeat. I want Kelly Olynyk packed up, chop his hair yeah, off. You, know, you don't see him too. on the court much anymore. Good He's, God. Yeah. Do they overvalue these players? Mm-hmm. It's unbelievable. These green teamers. Have you heard that phrase? Yeah. The green yeah. teamers? Mm-hmm. Like, get over yourself. Get these players out of here and go bring in some talent. So where do you think they? Al Horford is another one who's overrated too. Good team. But he, but he's more, he's a higher quality than those other guys. Yes, he is. I mean, he's a, he has a bigger wise, potential yeah. to make a difference. But you can't be, have him as your superstar. You cannot. Apparently he's not. not. It hasn't. Because he's not. So far, yeah. Um, are there any other players that you think could help the Celtics? That are on the market. I just, yeah. it doesn't seem like the market's shaped up yet. I mean, at the I, expense I know, of your Knicks, right? Uh, well, yeah, they're they're a different story. I mean, <laughs> the thing with that, they just they have. Other than Porzingis, they just have a couple good bench guys and aging stars. Yeah, you're not a Carmelo fan. I go back and forth on him. Yeah. the The way he scores makes you fall back in love with him. Yeah. I mean, just because he can just take over a game, even at yeah. this age, and yeah. with, with his knees. I mean, he's not super old, but mm-hmm. similar thing with Derrick Rose. The, the minutes add up, and yeah. their knees deteriorate in right. other parts. So, but he, he, if he can take over a game, and mm-hmm. with him. Like I said, a couple I've been I've been impressed with the bench play because that's something they haven't had in the last couple of years. Um, Courtney Lee and Brandon Jennings especially, um, and then with Porzingis there, I see potential, but it doesn't it doesn't seem like it's they played well. Don't get me wrong, and right. they've had a couple good wins, which have surprised me. But um, I'm not sold that they're going to have a, a a good year. That now would they deal away? It doesn't seem like they're in a position to to deal away any good players either. So yeah. I don't think I don't think you got players coming from coming from New York. At least at least not in uh, not in Manhattan. Maybe Brooklyn, mm-hmm. but not in, not in Manhattan. Any other moves that you expect, or any other surprises for the NBA? Anything else that's kicking that should be discussed? Uh, Can't really think of not anything. That I, no, it's no. It, to me the NBA is a little different. Yeah. Um, it takes. Well, it, I mean, it's, it's a lot different than the, the typical trade market stuff, especially mm-hmm. in, in a baseball and hockey. But it, it, I don't notice all, but also it takes a little longer for it to, to sort out. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's a little more volatile because mm-hmm. there's so much resting on mm-hmm. a small handful of players. The one thing that we do want to make sure we mention before we close out the basketball part is uh, longtime broadcaster Craig Sager mm-hmm. passed yeah. away this week. Um, he was the sideline reporter for TNT. He did some work with TBS for uh, the playoffs yeah. and all. He seemed like a very, very likable and nice guy. Mm-hmm. Nice all-around guy. Players loved him uh, doing the interviews and everything with him. So condolences out to Craig Sager and their family there, too. When we wrap up the show, which is right now, I mm-hmm. want to go over something that we did on the last episode that we had. It's called our Christmas wish list. Mm-hmm. Christmas wish list works like this. You're allowed to pick one thing for your favorite teams. So mm-hmm. it could be all your Mets and it could be your Giants or whatever. 
the one thing that you wish that they could have for Christmas, what would you give them? So we're going to start at the top. Mine is obviously going to stay with the Boston sports, Red Sox, Patriots, mm -hmm. Bruins, Celtics. If you want to go with the New York teams, that is fine by me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start off with the Red Sox as on my wish list. What I would give them, I would give them another year of David Ortiz. I would. Hmm. I would give them another year of Ortiz. I give him new feet, new <laughs> ankles, new toes, mm -hmm. head, shoulders, knees, and toes. No, I would give David Ortiz all mm -hmm. of that. That's what I would do for the Red Sox. Do you have mm -hmm. a different thing for baseball? Uh, for the Mets, I would uh, trade Jay Bruce, which I think they're going to. It seems like they're going to. They at least want to. That's what I'm yeah. hearing. Not a fan. Um, but they have a surplus of left-handed outfielders, okay. um, which makes them especially vulnerable to lefties. And I don't like how they've handled some of the younger players because of this with the platooning. Yep. And they need um, they need to beef up the bullpen. So okay. I'm hoping – I don't know what kind of value is out there for Jay Bruce because they've been hesitant. And mm -hmm. Sandy Olsen is naturally – that's his approach to, yep. to baseball transactions. But um, my wish, Christmas wish in that sense would be for that they can trade him and get a decent amount of value back, especially in the bullpen. We're going to hit NFL side of things. We're going to go this time with the Patriots. Uh, for me, for the Patriots, I would give the Patriots a Super Bowl trophy. I would make sure Brady is sitting and standing right next to Roger Goodell mm -hmm. when he sadly has to hand the lovely Lombardi over to him. Mm -hmm. And Brady has to sit there and smile, and I hope he hits him off the head with the trophy <laughs> for all the misery that he, that he allowed Tom Brady to have in the mm -hmm. past year. That's what I would have for the Patriots. Mm -hmm. For the Giants, what would you like? Um, uh, running game. A running consistent game. running game, right. I would say. Yeah, because they're a lot more effective. It opens the passing game for them, which yep. is the real weapon when they are able to move the ball on the ground. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to go to the Colts okay. um, and say I would like an offensive line for them okay. because I, it's hard to watch them waste yeah. away Andrew Luck's career, as it seems like they have, yeah. and for him to get hurt, especially with concussions. So... Uh, yeah, hopefully those those things happen. That's an interesting. That's a, that's a good one actually. Mm -hmm. Tell you the truth, Andrew Luck is a very talented quarterback. Or really, any supporting been. cast because really they have a support done a good system job. would be yeah. very good. Yeah. But on the Bruins front, I would give them the reset button. The reset mm -hmm. button would dial back about what was it, three, four years ago when Sagan and all the other moves <laughs> that the Bruins did just went downhill. Mm -hmm. So I would do the reset button and bring the players back that were here. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. Uh, yeah, with the Islanders, I would, I guess, do similar thing, but only to this past off season. Okay. Because they lost three major pieces, yeah. and they have seemingly responded by uh, signing long-term contracts to the fourth line forwards, which to me doesn't, doesn't really do it. doesn't make a lot of sense. No. And we've seen the effects of it this year. Yep. Um, so I would go back to the off season and at least – make a bigger push to sign uh, Franz Nielsen or, or Kyle Pozo, preferably Franz Nielsen. The Celtics one's very easy for me, mm -hmm. very easy. We've already went over it from before for the Celtics side of things. I would give them a superstar, whether it be DeMarcus Cousins, uh, whether it was Kevin Durant somehow coming here from mm -hmm. last year. Maybe it's Clay Thompson, who they've been rumored to be in discussions with and trying to get something to bring a star here to Boston so they mm -hmm. can win. Yeah. Uh, for the Knicks... Um, it's hard to say what they need because they haven't, they played well, but they haven't shown you anything that was like, wow, this is different. Right. Um, other than the bench, but I will say my wish is that they just at least make the playoffs or at least get the six or seven seeds because, the East is so poor. yeah, um, because I think the Knicks fans are starving a little bit because especially in a huge market and the Knicks are the Knicks playing at MSG, yeah. so. Um, I think maybe getting into the playoffs. I'm sure be, Phil Jackson is not too pleased with how they've been either. You thought he had a plan in the last couple of years. I, I, I was sold. I, yeah. I thought, I was like, okay, it's Phil Jackson. Something's going to work out. When Derek Fisher left, I, well, when they fired him, I was like, I guess, were, I guess the plan didn't work out. But not so much. They've responded this year, and um, like I said, a little impressed, but I wish that they kind of elongate this and at least get to the playoffs. Well, Brad, I want to thank you for joining us here on Face the Facts. It's a great quish, uh, Christmas wish list that we mm -hmm. came up with there. I hope we're able to uh, do another show before the holidays, but if we don't, I hope you have a great one. Thank you. Um, for Nick Face, we will see you next time on another episode of Face the Facts. Happy holidays to you all.